Hi, and welcome to Crypto Bible News. In today's news, we'll look at the following stories. George Soros phone holds Bitcoin. CEO says cryptocurrency has gone mainstream. The SEC just approved the closest thing to a US Bitcoin ETF that you can buy. Institutional investors dump gold for Bitcoin, seeing it as a far better inflation hedge. A UK man created Idiot Coin to study the hype coin craze. Has anyone seen Tether's billions? Now, before we get into the news, hit that like button, subscribe to Crypto Bible Channel, and don't forget to turn on the notifications button so you never miss any new episodes or videos. Now, let's get straight into the news. George Soros' fund holds Bitcoin. The CEO says cryptocurrency has gone mainstream. Soros Fund Management, founded by billionaire investor George Soros, has invested in Bitcoin. The CEO of the asset management company, Dawn Fitzpatrick, says Bitcoin is not just an inflation hedge. I think it's crossed the chasm into the mainstream. Fitzpatrick is both the CEO and Chief Investment Officer, CIO of Soros Fund Management. She is the first person in history to hold both titles. Discussing inflation, she said, if you watch gold in September, it was down about 5%. So I think the fear of debasing the US dollar has receded to a degree. In addition, she noted, the IMF just came out of a kind of reserve currency balances and the US dollar has stopped losing ground. Nonetheless, Bitcoin is trading above $50,000. Commenting on the rapid rise of the price of Bitcoin, Fitzpatrick opined, I am not sure Bitcoin is only viewed as an inflation hedge here. I think it's crossed the chasm into the mainstream. Cryptocurrencies now have a market cap of over $2 trillion. There's 200 million users around the world, so I think it's now safe to say it's gone mainstream from our perspective. The CEO of Soros Fund Management further revealed, We own some coins, but not a lot. And the coins themselves are less interesting than the use cases of DeFi and things like that. In March, Fitzpatrick said that the central bank digital currencies, CBDCs, is a potential threat to Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. However, she said that the threat will be temporary, emphasising, I don't think they'll be successful in permanently destabilising Bitcoin. At the time of filming, Bitcoin is trading at 53,982.51 and its market cap is around about 1.2 trillion. What do you think about the CEO of Soros Fund Management saying that Bitcoin has gone mainstream? Let us know in the comments section below. The SEC has just approved the closest thing to a US Bitcoin ETF that you can buy. The US SEC has approved an exchange traded fund ETF that tracks stocks with significant exposure to Bitcoin. These firms hold a majority of their net assets in Bitcoin or derive a majority of their profit or revenue from Bitcoin related activities. The actively managed fund Vault Crypto Industry Evolution and Tech ETF was approved on October the 5th. A new exchange traded fund may be as close as investors can get to having a US Bitcoin ETF, at least for now. Tad Park, CEO of the fund, calls these Bitcoin revolution companies and is eyeing MicroStrategy Marathon Digital Holdings and Bitfarms, amongst others, for the actively managed fund. Vault Crypto Industry Revolution and Tech ETF was approved on October the 5th and will trade under the ticker BTCR. Park said that he hopes to go public in the New York Stock Exchange in the next three weeks. I'm a strong believer in Bitcoin and was really excited about launching an ETF that could take advantage of the coming Bitcoin revolution, he said. We can get exposure to Bitcoin without necessarily holding the coin, especially with other positions. This roundabout investing strategy is necessary because the SEC, under Chair Gary Gensler, has been putting off approving Bitcoin ETFs, with nearly two dozen stuck in limbo amid fears for potential market manipulation. The US thus far has not approved a single one, though Gensler did recently note that he's more open to a Bitcoin's futures ETF. In Canada, however, Bitcoin ETFs are available as of now. As a result, the Vault ETF will not directly invest in Bitcoin. Instead, it looks to put at least 80% of its net assets in Bitcoin revolution companies, options and ETFs with exposure to those companies. The rest will go in broad equity markets to offset the risk of the portfolio. The ETF will also look at indicators such as the stock to flow model, which evaluates the current stock of Bitcoin against the flow of new Bitcoin mined that year. Park said that this is the first ETF that's Bitcoin focused compared to others that invest in a broader range of digital assets. It seems like it's not a big deal, but no one's ever done that before, he told the insider. The fund is the fifth ETF that San Francisco based Vault Equity has launched, but Park said it was by far the hardest, noting repeated back and forth within the SEC. 
While the reason for numerous delays is unclear, Park, a retail tech investor, speculated it was because the fund's initial name was Vault Bitcoin Revolution ETF. It was very difficult to get this through, but we're really glad that they finally approved it for us. JP Morgan, institutional investors dump gold for Bitcoin, seeing it as a far better inflation hedge. Global investment bank JP Morgan says institutional investors are returning to Bitcoin, seeing the cryptocurrency as a better hedge than gold. The firm's analysts described three key drivers boosting the price of Bitcoin in recent weeks, including assurances that the US policymakers will not ban cryptocurrencies. JP Morgan published a research tonight on Thursday stating that institutional investors are returning to Bitcoin, citing the trend of money flowing out of gold and into Bitcoin. The firm's analyst wrote, institutional investors appear to be returning to Bitcoin, perhaps seeing it as a better inflation hedge than gold. The analyst explained that there are three key drivers pushing the price of Bitcoin from around $40,000 up to $55,000 in a short period of time. The first is the recent assurances by US policymakers that there is no intention to follow China's steps towards banning the usage and mining of cryptocurrencies. Both Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell and SEC Chairman Gary Gensler told Congress this week they had zero intention to ban cryptocurrency, as China has. The SEC chief said his agency is taking a different approach to China, focusing on investor protection and regulation. The second reason is the recent lies of the Lightning Network and the second layer payment solution helped by El Salvador's Bitcoin adoption. JP Morgan detailed El Salvador made Bitcoin legal tender in early September. The country has bought 700 Bitcoins and President Nayib Bukele claimed that 3 million Salvadorans are already using the government's Bitcoin wallet, Shivo. The third reason is the re-emergence of inflation concerns among investors. It's renewed interest in the usage of Bitcoin as an inflation hedge. JP Morgan further explained that the trend of funds flowing out of gold and into Bitcoin has re-emerged in recent weeks. In May, the firm saw the opposite trend where funds float out of Bitcoin and into gold. According to the firm, more than $10 billion has flowed out of gold exchange traded ETFs since the beginning of the year. During the same time period, more than $20 billion has flowed into Bitcoin funds. Noting that those flows of funds into Bitcoin helped push Bitcoin's share of the total crypto market to nearly 45%, from a low of 41% in mid-September. The increase in the share of Bitcoin is a healthy development as it is more likely to reflect institutional participation rather than small cryptocurrencies. Meanwhile, JP Morgan CEO Jamie Damon believes that Bitcoin has no intrinsic value and regulators will regulate the hell out of it. His investment bank, however, is currently offering multiple crypto investments to its clients. What do you think about JP Morgan's analysis? Let us know in the comments section below. Today we have our news feature, the crazy world of crypto. A UK man created Idiot Coin to study the hype coin craze. It took a few minutes and $300 to mint 21 million coins that hundreds of people were clamoring to buy. A New York Times reporter created Idiot Coin to illustrate the craze around the so-called hype coins. Millions of people wanting to make money have been drawn in by hype coins that hold little intrinsic value or are outright scams. Reporter David Segal marketed Idiot Coin to look at an obvious fiasco, definitely not going to the moon. In the world of hype coins, developers in the highly speculative end of the cryptocurrency market promise riches to potential investors with appealing sounding assets that in reality have little or no intrinsic value or outright scams. To explain and explore to the world, a reporter from the New York Times created the Idiot Coin. The point was to demonstrate that creating a coin Hype coin in this case does not take any expertise that many are flimsy and in fact dangerous. Reporter David Segal wrote in a feature called Going for Broken Crypto Land, Segal detailed his journey that he wanted to end with no one financially harmed. His report said dozens of hype coins are created every single day by developers who operate with little oversight and draw in millions upon millions of people looking to make some quick money. It usually ends poorly with most tokens becoming totally worthless within a couple of weeks, while the developers can rake in tens of thousands of dollars. Britain-based Segal, in creating Idiot Coin, consulted two lawyers, one in London and one over in the US, about the legality of establishing what sounded like a security and putting it up for sale. Both said regulators in either country could 
sue the coin creators. Avoiding trouble meant making sure that Idiot Coin would be a definite flop, he said. He said estimated losses from hype coin investments range from hundreds of millions of dollars up to a billion a year. Segal eventually paid about $300 in fees and getting to the point where 21 million Idiot Coins were minted. The reporter, working with Dan Ariola, a man based in Taiwan, who was in a warning to would-be investors, posted a YouTube tutorial about how to make and promote a scam coin. Segal also hired a web designer to build that coinforidiots.com website. The site contained a white paper that's supposed to outline the coin's appeal. Mine employs investors to scram. He wrote. He hired a TikToker to hype up Idiot Coin, a job that he did by fanning fake $100 bills in a parody of Opulence. Segal also wrote an announcement for Crypto Moonshots, a Reddit page on which new crypto is unveiled, definitely not going to the moon. Segal wrote, might not get an inch off the ground. His marketing efforts also include a social media post with links to the Idiot Coin Telegram account. He said about 300 people worldwide showed up and some were left confused by the pessimistic pitch. I was letting down these people by refusing to promise them any riches. On his website for Idiot Coin, he wrote, Idiot Coin has nothing to recommend it. You can't do anything with a coin except hope it's gonna increase in value. And that will not happen. No amount of shilling on social media will make this baby budge. So don't get any ideas about creating a buzz around it on Twitter or Discord or Reddit or anywhere else. It's hopeless. There's a total of 21 million idiot coins. 7 million can be acquired. The problem is there's only about $30 of liquidity. That's a fancy word for money in the coin. Yep, it's next to nothing. Most coins start off with $1,000 worth of liquidity. It's almost as though the idiot coin developer wants this thing to fail. This year's boom in the broader cryptocurrency market pushed its valuation past $2 trillion, although sell-offs driven largely by regulatory threats have brought that down to roughly $1.7 trillion. The market's most prominent meme currency is Dogecoin, which started in 2013 by two programmers spoofing the cryptocurrency craze. The price so far this year has surged by nearly 4,300%, trading to around $0.21 or $0.21, bringing its market capitalization to around $27 billion. Has anyone seen Tether's billions? Today, we start a sort of mini-series for the new show, whereby we take a look at the story by Zeke Fo, who has spent most of this year investigating where are Tether's billions. A wild search for the US dollars, supposedly back in a stable coin at the centre of the global cryptocurrency trade, and in the crosshairs of US regulators and prosecutors in July. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen summoned the chair of the Federal Reserve, the head of Securities and Exchanges Commission, and six other top officials for a meeting to discuss Tether. The absurdity of the situation couldn't have been lost on them. Inflation was spiking, a COVID surge threatened the economic recovery, and Yellen wanted to talk about a digital currency dreamed up by the former child actor who'd missed a penalty shot in the Mighty Ducks. But Tether had gotten so large that it threatened to actually put the US in financial system at risk. It was as if a playground snowball fight had escalated so wildly that the Joint Chiefs of Staff were being called in to avert a nuclear war. Tether is what's come to be known as a financial circles as a stable coin. Stable because one Tether is supposed to be backed by one dollar, but it's actually more like a bank. The company that issues the currency, Tether Holdings Limited, takes in dollars from people who want to trade crypto and credits the digital wallets with an equal amount of Tethers in return. Once they have their Tethers, people can send them to cryptocurrency exchanges and use them to bet on the price of Bitcoin, Ether, or any of the thousands of other coins. And at least in theory, Tether Holdings holds onto the dollars so it can return them to anyone who wants to send in their tokens and get the money back. The convoluted mechanism became popular because real banks didn't want to do the business with crypto companies, especially foreign ones. Exactly how Tether is backed or if it's truly backed at all has always been a mystery. For years, a persistent group of critics has argued that despite the company's assurances, Tether Holdings doesn't actually have enough assets to maintain the one-to-one -one exchange rate, meaning its coin is essentially fraudulent. In the crypto world, where joke coins and pictures of dogs on can be worth billions of dollars, and scammers periodically make fortunes with preposterous sounding schemes, Tether seemed like just another curiosity. Then this year, Tether Holdings started putting out a huge amount of digital coins that are now 69 billion, yes, 69 billion Tethers in circulation. 48 billion of them issued this year alone. That means the company supposedly holds a corresponding 69 billion in real money in the bank to back the coins. 
an amount that would make it one of the top 50 largest banks in the US, if indeed it was a US bank and not an unregulated offshore company. On Twitter, on business TV and on hedge fund and investment banking training floors, everyone has started asking why Tether was minting so many coins and whether it really had the money that it claimed to have. An anonymous anti-Tether blog post titled The Bit Short inside crypto's doomsday machine went viral and CNBC host Jim Cramer told viewers to sell their crypto. If Tether collapsed, well then, it's going to gut the whole crypto ecosystem, he warned. As far as the regulators are concerned, the size of Tether's supposed dollar holdings is so big that it would be dangerous, even if assuming the dollars are real. If enough traders ask for their dollars back at once, the company could have to liquidate its assets at a loss, setting off a run on the not bank. The losses could cascade into the regulated financial system by crashing credit markets. If the trolls are right and Tether is indeed a Ponzi scheme, it would be larger than Bernie Madoff, the infamous Ponzi man. Earlier this year, Mr. Foe set out to solve the mystery. The money trail led from Taiwan to Puerto Rico to the French Riviera, mainland China, Bahamas. One of Tether's former bankers told me its top executive had been putting its reserves at risk by investing them to earn potentially hundreds of millions of dollars of profit for himself. It's not a stable coin, it's a high-risk offshore hedge fund, said John Betts, who ran a bank in Puerto Rico that Tether used. Even their own banking partners don't know the extent of their holdings or if they even exist. A green pentagon emblazoned with a white T represents the Tether coin, on which the company's website promises digital money for a digital age. The logo doesn't look like much, but it's probably the most normal thing about Tether holdings, which is a weird in almost every way imaginable. Only a dozen employees are listed on LinkedIn, yes, only 12, a tiny number of a company with 69 billion under management. Tether's website also touts a settlement with New York's Attorney General. But the announcement of that settlement made it sound like the company had been up to some horrible stuff. Tether Holdings had been operated by unlicensed and unregulated individuals and entities doing its darkest corners of the financial system. Letitia James, the Attorney General, said in a statement, Elsewhere on the website, there's a letter from an accounting firm stating that Teva has the reserves to back its coins, along with a pie chart showing about 30 billion of its dollar holdings are invested in commercial paper, short-term loans to corporations, in commercial paper, short-term loans to corporations. That would make Teva the seventh largest holder of such debt, right up there with Charles Schwab and the Vanguard Group. To fact check this claim, Mr. Foe canvassed Wall Street traders to see if any had seen Tether buying anything. No one had. It's a small market with a lot of people and they all know each other, said Deborah Cunningham, Chief Investment Officer at Global Money Markets at Federated Hermes, an asset management company in Pittsburgh. If there were a new entrant, it would usually be very obvious. It wasn't clear which regulatory body is responsible for overseeing Tether. On a podcast, a company representative said it was registered with the British Virgin Islands Financial Investigation Agency. But the agency's director, Errol George, said in an email that it doesn't oversee Tether. We don't and never have. The chief executive officer listed on Tether's website, J.L. Vanderveld, is a Dutchman who lives in Hong Kong and seems never to have given an interview or spoken at a conference. The CFO is Giancarlo Dovacini, a former plastic surgeon from Italy who was once described on Tether's website as the founder of a successful electronics business. The only reference to him that turned up in a search of Italian newspapers showed that he was once fined for selling counterfeit Microsoft software. Hmm. He didn't respond to emails or messages on Telegram, where he goes by Merlin the Wizard. In our next show, we'll follow on with this story and see just how far Mr. Foe has got with the investigation's lead. And on that note, thank you so much for watching the news today. Please do not forget to hit that like button, subscribe to the Crypto Bible channel, and don't forget to turn on the notifications button so you never miss any new videos. Join our Discord group and you can find us on all the social platforms in the links below the description. Leave your thoughts and comments about today's stories. And once again, thank you for joining in and enjoy your day.